Good, good afternoon. Um, uh, on behalf of the uh, McLean Center, uh, the Boston Institute for Neuroscience, Quantitative Biology, and Human Behavior, I'm delighted to welcome you back to the 2050 and 16 lecture series on ethical issues in neuroethics. Uh, this lecture series, as I've told you before, was organized by John Monsell, who's here with us, and Peggy Mason from Neurobiology, and Dan Solvesi from the McLean Center. Uh, I, I have an announcement to make before we start. Today's session uh, by Dr. Warnke will be the first session in the winter quarter. We are not meeting next week. So the session that is, that is scheduled for January 20th uh, has been uh, postponed. And so we will resume these lectures for the rest of the quarter, uh, two weeks from today, on January 27th, with Professor Jason Bridges, talking about mind, brain, and mechanism. But it's important, we'll, we'll try to send out uh, an email notice also uh, on, on this point, but, but no meeting next week. Uh, today we're delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Peter Warnke, uh, who's a professor of surgery and neurology and the director of the stereotactic and functional neurosurgery here at the university. Uh, Peter is an internationally renowned neurosurgeon who's performed, listen to these numbers, more than 3,000 stereotactic surgeries and more than 1,000 brain tumor surgeries. Dr. Warnke is one of the few neurosurgeons in the United States who has experience with dopamine transporter imaging uh, and is studying uh, the use of such imaging to predict responses to deep brain stimulation in Parkinson's disease. Dr. Warnke also is researching the development of biological and minimally invasive treatments for epilepsy, movement disorders, brain tumors, and is studying the tumor physiology of medulloblastomas in pediatric brain tumors. Dr. Warnke is the Associate Editor of the Journal of Neurology, Neurosurgery, and Psychiatry, a journal which has one of the highest impact factors among neurosurgical journals. Today, uh, Dr. Warnke will talk to us uh, on a talk entitled, Behavioral Change in Deep Brain Stimulation. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Peter Warnke. Thank you, Peter. Thank, thank you very much for this uh, very, if not overly kind, uh, introduction. And uh, I'd like to structure the uh, talk in predominantly three parts. Number one, I'll take you a little bit through the clinical uh, aspects and the actual technique of deep brain stimulation, which was developed originally for movement disorders, but is spreading out to different diseases now. Uh, so you get a feel for the intricacies. Based on that, uh, I'll then show you some uh, data on the actual biological effects, including the network activation that we achieve with deep brain stimulation of very tiny little structures in the brain, which will answer the question uh, that is behind the title. There should actually be a question mark because a lot of papers in the early 90s came out questioning whether actually there was a behavioral change induced by deep brain stimulation of deep subcortical structures. And I hope the data will uh, show you how overly naive that question actually was. And the third part actually will then focus on deep brain stimulation intended to change behavior, i.e. in psychiatric diseases, predominantly depression and uh, OCD. And in all three aspects, I'd like to view this from two angles, the patient's perspective and the surgical neurologist's perspective, who actually does perform the deep brain simulation. And you'll see this perspective is entirely different. And in the end, hopefully, we can then discuss whether and to what extent deep brain stimulation in what structures really does change behavior. And bear in mind, and I'll elaborate on that, 
everything changes behavior. Walking the sacred halls of the University of Chicago certainly does, I can tell you that. Uh, but all these patients take different drugs, video games change behavior, etc. So we have to put this into the right perspective. Uh, these are my disclosures, uh, just for the sake. So there's nothing new about the brain stimulation or any kind of neurosurgery. There's this wonderful book. Some, some of you might have read this. Uh, and the neurologist knew this since decades. When the air hits the brain, and the title of the book continues, life is never going to be the same again. It's a memoir of a uh, Philadelphia neurosurgeon. And that is true. Any intervention we perform in the brain, introducing a little pneumocephalus by a craniotomy, will have some behavioral change. The point is, do we change behavior where we actually harm the patient? This is why I put this very fashionable book title next to it. Or is this a totally tolerable side effect? And the other point about this book, of course, do no harm, is very easy. If you don't do surgery, you don't harm. So, but you also have to be efficacious as well. And that balance is the delicate one that we have to strike. So to start back. Deep brain stimulation was actually brought to clinical applications by the Grenoble group of neurosurgeons and neurologists who used it to treat one symptom of a disease, which is tremor. And they first started to uh, target the thalamus, then the globus pallidus, and then the subthalamic nucleus. And the reason for that was the old uh, DeLong model from Emory uh, showing these circuits, which actually, <coughs> just to step uh, ahead, tells you already, as this is a circuit, and each component is, of course, creating a network and contributing to a network, if you manipulate one of them, you will manipulate the others. Um, so you can see the circuit between the subthalamic nucleus, the thalamus, and the globus pallidum. And that is, of course, extremely important for motor coordination. And you see the difference in a normal person versus a Parkinson person. And the difference stems from the degeneration of the substantia nigra and the depletion of the uh, dopamine stores. Uh, but it tells you already there is a connection of these deep basal ganglia structures to the cortex. At that point in time, which was in 85, 86, nobody thought that this would ever change behavior, the ability of decision making, including moral decisions, etc., because this was all subcortical. And the idea was we are all very rational cortical human beings. Uh, far from so, I can tell you. But so this is the idea. And it then evolved through different randomized controlled trials from the thalamus being effective to the globus pallidus to the subthalamic nucleus being the most effective to treat tremor, but also bradykinesia and the side effects of the dopaminergic medication, which is L-dopa-induced dyskinesias. So the subthalamic nucleus has really been crystallizing out as the most effective target. Interesting aspect of all of this is in all treatments neurosurgery has to offer, deep brain stimulation is the only one that has pure evidence class one. It's really in multiple international randomized controlled trials. The only other disease that has class one evidence is epilepsy. And that actually is uh, limited to temporal lobectomy for temporal epilepsy. Uh, that's where we have crystal clear data. So it is very efficacious. And we know it lasts. The other problem was when this was started that you would have the same problem with deep brain stimulation like you would have with dopaminergic medication. After years, you would run out, the effect would go down. That's not the case. Even 20 years, and we are now more than 20 years out in, in the European centers, uh, the effect on the motor symptoms is still there, and it's actually not diminished. But it is only treating the symptoms, not treating the neurodegenerative process. The substantia nigra degenerates. There are very good studies from the Max Planck group in Cologne on longitudinal studies on actually L-DOPA PET uh, showing that the L-DOPA content goes down continuously in an almost linear fashion. So we're not treating the neurodegenerative process. We're treating the symptoms. <coughs> 
And we can do this, I've talked about this very effectively, uh, but you have to be extremely precise. And I'd like to look at this little five millimeter bar. So this uh, little structure, the subthalamic nucleus that we are targeting, has roughly the size of a squashed pea, very, very deep inside the brain. So you have to hit this with ultimate precision. And actually, it's not the STN we are stimulating. That has been crystal clear from the uh, study so far. It's actually the dorsal third of the STN, which is the motor part of the STN, which leads up to the interesting question of behavioral change, because there are also other parts particularly the anterior parts of the subthalamic nucleus, which are intrinsically related to actually behavior and even decision analysis. Uh, so this is where we put our electrodes. And in order to do that, <coughs> you need, as I said, precision. So the patient is totally immobilized in a stereotactic frame. You have to use multiple image modalities, MRI and CT. And this is a fused hybrid image. It looks very odd for those who know CTs and MRIs. It's half CT, half MRI scan. So we fuse those images. And then you can see the trajectories we design. And the blue actually is a, <coughs> a digital atlas, uh, the Schaltenbrand atlas, that shows the brain that is reformatted to the individual patient's brain. And only if you have precisely targeted that area, then we proceed with surgery. So that's, that's the technique we use uh, in this day and age. And this is all done in the patient completely awake, because we are testing the patient, which is interesting because you could also say, with all these super precise imaging, you have an imaging target, you know exactly where to put this. And you can do direct targeting, and you can see the subthalamic nucleus, or you can do indirect targeting just using the ventricular configuration of the patient. But images can still be misleading. We do this in an awake patient and test the patient. So we see exactly when we hit these structures whether the tremor appears or doesn't appear. And furthermore, uh, when that's just relying on clinical testing, we use microelectrodes inserted. Microelectrodes, which are so small you can basically not really see them with your naked eye, which allow us to do single cell recordings. So we record from these structures, particularly from the subthalamic nucleus and from the thalamus, from single cells and can identify the number. We are putting actually multiple electrodes in parallel down there, the tremor cells. So you can see a cell firing synchronous to the tremor of the patient. And if you hit those cell populations, that's really where you know your electrode has to go. So this is treating very basic physiology, not an image or not a volume, but the actual area where the tremor is generated. And that pertains to Parkinson's disease, dystonia, MS-related tremor, all kinds of uh, movement disorders. And then, actually, that's one of the advantages here at the University of Chicago. We actually still want to make absolutely sure that we are where we want to be. We have an intraop CT scanner. So we do a scan during the surgery and make sure that our electrodes are really where we calculated them to be. So that's, that's the whole procedure. And um, <clears throat> if by now you haven't realized, this is a day's job. So this takes a whole day, and it's very stressful for the patient. Uh, because the patient has to be fully awake for the whole procedure for hours, immobilized in a stereotactic frame where he can't move his head. And on top of that, we make it even more stressful for the patient. Number one, the patient is not one of us. It's a Parkinson patient who has already radiokinesia, is immobilized. And to have a very clean slate to test the patient on, we take them off all their medication, which they need to control their movement disorder. So they are off medication, and if they have a lot of bedikinesia rigidity, it's very uncomfortable for the patient. Yeah, they are very stiff, and you have to operate as fast as you can, but still get the answers you need to achieve the precise targeting. And uh, so this is what you can do then. We can do this very precisely and uh, reproducibly. We've done uh, several hundred of these uh, procedures. Um, but the question, and that brings us back to the talk, is 
what are we really doing? We are, of course, stopping the tremor, and that's for the medical students in the OR and the, even the residents. That's the most fantastic thing. You see the patient shaking wildly on the table to the point that it's sometimes hard to insert precisely your electrodes. And as soon as you turn it on, and it takes about uh, one, two volts through a tiny electrode, the tremor stops immediately, completely. And the patient usually, and that's the first behavioral change you induce with DBS, gets completely euphoric. But <clears throat> right? then you turn it off, and the tremor reappears within a second, basically. So that's nice, and this is what everybody focused on in the late 80s, early 90s, that we can stop tremors, we can relieve bradykinesia, we can reduce the medication for these patients. But are we not also doing this, rewiring the brain? Because we are stimulating the subthalamic nucleus, and by that, with all the axonal connection, we must have an effect on at least the supplementary motor area, on other cortices, etc plus other basal ganglia structure, and actually the outflow of the subthalamic nucleus goes straight into the pallidum, so that some people actually wanted to rename subthalamic nucleus uh, stimulation in just doing a smart pallidotomy. And the interesting thing is we were actually interested not so much in the behavioral aspects or the cognitive, we were interested in the effects of deep brain stimulation on metabolism and physiology from a different angle, from the angle of how can we predict the response to deep brain stimulation if we do intraoperative PET scans or CT scans and see how the patient metabolically responds. Because 85% of the patients with the tremor respond fantastically with almost a complete abolition of the tremor. But 15%, although you have super precise targeting, do not really respond, which might have to do with a couple of things. Either we didn't hit the right target, or Parkinson's disease is not one disease for which the evidence is growing by the hour. It is a variety of different diseases, probably clearly with different uh, molecular genetics underlying it, and uh, different phenotypes. Some people have tremor. We have a lot of Parkinson patients that have no tremor at all, but solely bradykinesia. This must be a different disease. Etc. So th this was our angle when we started to study these patients in terms of effects generally on metabolism and physiology. And this is one uh, of the very early studies where we did FDG PETs. And what you can see already, <coughs> and that shows you how naive the question is, does it change behavior? Of course it does, because it changes the network. Is you get an overall, and this has been repeated by numerous uh, investigators, an overall increase in glucose utilization. If you stimulate the tiny area of the subthalamic nucleus, and we're really talking about like 170,000 neurons out of a billion that we stimulate uh, and can reach with the tiny electrodes we implant and the little current we give. So we get an overall network effect, which is uh, quite dramatic and can be quantified very, very easily. This then lets, led us to a different study where we actually looked at uh, Parkinson patients treated with different types of interventions in the basal ganglia. Lesions like a pallidotomy, purely tremor-related stimulations in the uh, <coughs> VIM, ventral intermediate uh, nucleus of the thalamus, and the subthalamic nucleus. And we did this under very rigid conditions. Off seven days post-surgery, we repeated the study. And we looked at uh, dopamine transporter uh, molecules, metabolism, glucose utilization, and blood flow, and uh, used the UPDRS rating scale. Still, again, under the idea that we could use this to predict and therefore stratify patients being good candidates for deep brain stimulation versus alternative treatments. And the interesting thing is what we found is that if you look at the responders and uh, the effect of deep brain stimulation on the glucose utilization, you see sort of a staircase phenomenon. And these three um, bars uh, signify three different things. Uh, the red is pre-stimulation, before we did any surgery. Uh, 
The yellow one is, which has been neglected in the literature for almost 10 years, is the so-called micro subthalamotomy effect. We didn't stimulate, we just put the electrode in. That creates a tiny micro lesion which already, in a lot of patients, stops the tremor in the OR immediately. It does come back because the brain can compensate that. And then the uh, greenish bar is on top of that, the stimulation turned on. And you see, this is not just in the thalamus, not even only in the supplementary motor area, also in the frontal cortex, you see this metabolism. And there's actually a recent study from last week from Günther Deutschel's group in Kiel, who's one of the pioneers of this, who actually showed if you do not have this pattern, which we see in responders, they don't respond very well, we've shown that, but he actually looked at the cortical thickness of Parkinson patients and about 40 patients, and predicted based on that, which is a biomarker of the cortical integrity in these PD patients, that if your cortical integrity was impaired, you would not have a good response. So it's not as simple as people thought that it's just stopping the tremor cells in the STN. You need to influence the whole network, and the network needs to be in a shape to be influenced, which is interesting. And if you look at the non-responders, non-responders means they didn't get a 50% improvement in the unified Parkinson's disease rating scale, which is the UPDRS. You see in the frontal cortex still sort of staircase phenomenon, but it's much, much milder, and not the same thing in the SMA and the thalamus. So these patients behave metabolically differently, they have a different response to deep brain stimulation which is quite interesting. And then, and there was a reason, and there's a link to behavior and uh, cognitive effects, we looked at the actual really interesting thing, because Parkinson's is a dopamine disease. It's a dopamine depletion disease because of the degeneration of the uh, substantia nigra. And one of the theories was that actually stimulating the STN, the outflow to the striatum, and that's where the actual dopamine depletion becomes effective for the Parkinson patient, would sort of energize the striatum and get more dopamine there. And a uh, little bit of a simplistic approach, but we wanted to look at this. Uh, we did this uh, quite some time ago with a uh, marker which binds specifically a radio ligand to the dopamine transporter protein in the striatum which uh, wasn't available until four years ago in the US, so we had to do this in Europe, and uh, this was our protocol. And the interesting thing is that if you look at pre-op 12 hours, everybody was studied off medication because I can modulate these images by the dopamine level in the brain easily, so you have to have very rigid conditions 12 hours off medication. You can see what happens. It's almost like with the glucose utilization, except it's the other way around. You see, just putting the electrode in without turning it on reduces the uh, expression of the DET uh, protein, and then stimulation reduces it further. And first, we were actually a little bit puzzled what does it mean, <coughs> because if you have less dopamine expression, uh, dopamine transporter expression, uh, that, that's a, although it's upregulated very quickly in the brain, within a couple of hours, uh, that would be the opposite of what we want. We want actually more dopamine. But of course, this is a ligand competing with the dopamine that's occurring. So you see less binding if you actually have more dopamine coming in as well. That's another explanation. So we're still working on quantifying these, these data, so I can't give you the definitive answer. But the important thing is, we are, and that leads us to, to the interesting question. If deep brain stimulation can modify dopamine binding, whatever the mechanism is, dopamine is one of the most powerful drugs to change behavior and cognition, as we know. Uh, of course it will change behavior. And this is actually the numerical data. You can see pre-electrode uh, in and then stimulation, a significant drop uh, for the dead binding capacity. So this is all nice and good, and we know we can modulate networks, we can change this.
and does that actually change the patient's behavior, mood, decisional capacity, etc. And the patient, quite rightly, comes and asks, you are putting electrodes into my brain, allegedly very deep, <clears throat> not in the cortex, we're not stimulating the cortex like an epilepsy patient, uh, but does that really make me a different person? Which is a very legitimate question, but it's actually very, very difficult to answer because it brings us back to very ancient philosophy, what is the person and the personality. But that's the question we are usually faced with, which is very interesting. <coughs> and um, I would like you to bear all these questions in mind because that, that's the patient's perspective and the doctors view this completely differently. And one of the things is, will I lose my free will? And that's a very good question because one of the hallmarks the cognitive hallmarks of Parkinson's disease is impulse disorder. A lot of these patients, particularly in high doses of dopamine, become very impulsive to the point that you have to stop them going to the casino every day and lose all their money, uh, which actually very f is not frequent, but it happens in about 3 to 5 percent of patients, which is a serious problem. Interestingly, this is linked to the dopamine level and the dopamine medication you need, but one of the effects of subthalamic nucleus stimulation is you can turn down their dopamine. A couple of patients had no impulse disorder, got STN implants, they were turned on, and then developed impulse disorder, which is quite interesting. And that's, a, of course, a major behavioral change. So, which leads to the question, will I lose my free will? A legitimate question. Uh, we'll come to that. But what you can also see is yes, subthalamic nucleus, or let's say deep brain stimulation, does change things. But these patients are already sick, so they have a neurodegenerative process that is changing their personality to begin with. They are on excessively high doses of dopamine, which changes their personality dramatically. So we need to see. The other thing is, and I have a lot of sympathy with that, <coughs> is that patients realize they completely rely on the impulse generator, which is a battery implanted in their chest to run these deep brain stimulators. So they will depend in their mobility, but also in their ability to reduce their dopamine, etc., on a battery implanted in their chest. And that battery is pretty sensitive. If you have an MRI scan, it turns it off, and all of a sudden, all your symptoms come back, but you don't have the dopamine to cover it, etc. So a couple of patients are very afraid to become dependent on a battery. Very reasonable. <clears throat> and then the point is, indeed, when the battery drains, which we try to prevent by checking them regularly, and when we see that the battery comes to the end of its life, we bring them in and change the battery. But what happens if the battery drains and you're on a vacation in Hawaii and you can't just get a new battery immediately? That, that's a legitimate reason of fear. And then the interesting question is, and again, there are some preliminary reports uh, on patients already, is continuous stimulation of the subthalamic nucleus not changing my, uh, my brain, the actual physical brain? What we can tell you is exactly, for some patients who unfortunately died for different reasons, when the brain was examined uh, about three months, six months, even 18 months after deep brain stimulation, you get a gliotic scar, of course, surrounding it. And you get widespread in some patients. We don't know which ones are the ones. You get gliosis surrounding this, uh, almost tumor-like. So you do change the actual anatomical environment in a very small way, but you do do this. So those are the patient's perspectives, rightly so. <clears throat> the surgical neurologist sees this completely differently. So actually, the disease makes you already a different person. I mean, 90% of my patients <coughs> uh, have already a reactive depression. If you have Parkinson's disease, you cannot move, you have this embarrassing tremor, you can't go to a restaurant because you spill your food all the time. That already makes you a different person, the disease per se. And on top of that, we put them on a gram of dopamine and more sometimes. 
And that changes your personal and your behavior dramatically as well. So the contribution of DBS might be almost negligible compared to what the disease does to your brain. That's the doctor's perspective. <clears throat> and interestingly, uh, the, the recent paper from the Grenoble group of all that actually looked in the population of artists they had in their Parkinson patients, painters predominantly, and uh, looked at their level of creativity. And after deep brain stimulation, their creativity went down. And they couldn't really correlate this very well until they looked at the actual dopamine. So the whole point is to take the dopaminergic medication down. And the, a lot of these painters lost their creativity because their dopaminergic medication was taken away from them, which led them to the slightly over-exaggerated thesis, creativity, it's all dopamine. Yeah, take dopamine, you'll become an artist. Uh, not quite, but anyway. Um, the question of the patient, will I rely on the impulse generator, will it change? Yeah, well, you do, but actually your brain doesn't work, so the impulse generator just restores your normal brain function. And what happens when the battery drains? Your disease will take over. And of course, we are talking about a brain disease, and it's not, we know Parkinson's in particular is, of course, not just a disease of the substantia nigra. There are other systems involved as well. So we would actually wish if we could change your brain with the deep brain stimulation because it needs change because it is actually literally dying uh, in front of you. And the symptoms uh, are the proof of that. So very different perspective from the patient's perspective. And that has to be uh, borne in mind. So, and then you can take the hardcore view. <coughs> I, I love that. So. <laughs> We can, this brings me back to my original remark, you can, you can change this dramatically and your level of serotonin and dopamine and you can change it by the environment you put people in, yeah? Sacred halls like University of Chicago, you can watch violent movies, uh, all of these changes things. So whatever you do will change and affect your behavior. The question is to what extent and how is this seen in the overarching view of the disease you are suffering from? And what are you buying? So, and the interesting thing is, as I said, the disease itself changes the brain so dramatically. Uh, this is from uh, one of David Adelberg's uh, from uh, New York, uh, famous papers uh, which follow along the lines that uh, we wanted to establish with finding patients with a specific disease pattern which allows us to determine that they will respond to the brain stimulation. And he found in Parkinson patients two different metabolic patterns. You can see if you have an optimal response, and this is to pallidotomy actually, the pallidum is hyperactive, overusing glucose, and that's causing actually uh, the symptoms. Whereas if you have the same patient, clinically, phenotypically the same patient, but not an overactive pallidum, you can do a pallidotomy and you don't have a big effect on the movement. So patients are already neurologically and neurophysiologically different, which is very important to bear in mind. Then, of course, the neuropsychologists kicked in because by then in 2005 and from then on, so in the last 10 years, we had so many patients operated that we created a wonderful population to study. <clears throat> and uh, this is one of the first case reports uh, published in JNNP of all journals, where they found to be able to induce manic behavior immediately when they turned on the deep brain stimulator. And uh, actually the first response of the neurosurgical community was, well, you probably put it in the wrong place. Actually, they, they didn't. <coughs> it is exactly in the right place and you got a little bit of substantia nigra uh, stimulation, which you inevitably have to get. We're talking about a millimeter or two distance between the subthalamic nucleus and the substantia nigra. Actually, we deliberately go with our microelectrodes into the substantia nigra to find the specific response pattern to know exactly where it physiologically is. So that came a little bit as a shocking surprise that you can change behavior. The big problem is it is very, very difficult to disentangle 
behavioral changes induced by deep brain stimulation unless you look at immediate changes. Because if you look at a patient tested neuropsychologically before deep brain stimulation and then three months later with the stimulation on, you don't know what you're looking at because by then you have changed the medication dramatically and that it has a big impact <coughs> on behavioral aspects. Uh, you have changed the symptoms and the patient becomes euphoric because of that. Patients become mobile, more outgoing, etc. So you can only really in a clean experimental setting look at changes almost intraoperatively. And that is a totally artificial situation. You have a patient who's off medication, the head is fixed in a frame. We don't know whether this really <coughs> has anything to do with real life changes. And then we've talked about that already, uh, hold your horses. So uh, it's very interesting if you look at impulsivity and deep brain stimulation because it is so closely linked to the dopamine levels. So unless you have a very clean experimental paradigm where you keep your dopamine stable or test them in the off, uh, you don't really know what you're doing. But clearly there are cases which have been reported to induce impulsivity with constant dopaminergic medication by deep brain stimulation. And to be fair, we have no metabolic, physiological, or molecular marker to identify these patients up front. And there's a tragic component to that as well. <coughs> and that is that you can also increase negative impulsivity in these patients. And these patients, as I said, are reactively clinically depressed, a lot of them, because of their symptoms. And there have been reports that have shown that after deep brain stimulation, patients became suicidal. And some actually, unfortunately, did commit suicide. So that is something you have to bear in mind. In order, of course, to reduce that risk as much as we can, every patient has to undergo neuropsychological testing. And actually, depression uh, on the uh, test scores is a contraindication brain stimulation because you could potentially kick them over the edge. So no doubt we can change behavior. Whether that relates to change in personality is a different aspect and I'll, I'll come to that in a second. Interestingly, this is a wonderful paper, <coughs> not the highest impact factor journal, I agree. Um, ethical safety of uh, deep brain stimulation and they did a study on moral decision making in Parkinson's disease. So they actually confronted them with moral paradigms and uh, it doesn't change the moral coordinate system. So <coughs> I'm almost ten intended to say you cannot convert a Donald Trump supporter to a Hillary <coughs> Clinton supporter with that, um, <coughs> although some would wish. but. Uh, <coughs> It doesn't really seem to change the deeply ingrained mor moral opinions people have. But that's a different thing from changing behavior, being more impulsive, more outgoing, things like that. Um, so the next question is, sorry, uh, as you see, we're now switching from the adult Parkinson patient to the pediatric population. And I'm doing this because we're talking about personality change. The, again, very well evidence-based uh, studies showing that pediatric patients with generalized dystonia, which is a dreadful disease, uh, and it usually doesn't occur isolated, but in combination with cerebral palsy and dystonia, and either the palsy or the dystonia can be the predominant feature, but these patients basically respond very, very poorly, if at all, to any medication, but again, pioneered by the group in Montpellier from France, if you early on implant deep brain stimulus in the pallidum, you can dramatically improve these patients, and uh, this is actually uh, from this paper, um, and you, the uh, <coughs> Uh, Fan Masten uh, dystonia rating scale can come down, and the lower your value, uh, the better is the patient. Oh. But this is something in a developing juvenile brain, we're implanting the brain stimulators. And how that relates to cognitive development, we have no idea. <laughs> 
there's no data and certainly it's not done for such a long period that we know how these patients are and how different they could be from adults, deep brain stimulation versus not treated patients. But then, again, how do you want to disentangle that? If you don't treat the patient or give them best medical treatment as the control group, these patients will have cognitive changes based on their dreadful dystonia. So again, it's the price you're willing to pay for symptom improvement. Um, but it's, it's dramatic, these patients, and the, the big fight we have we're one of the very few centers uh, in the U.S. that do pediatric uh, dystonia treatment because uh, you have to have a pediatric neurosurgeon as well, and unfortunately I was forced to become one <coughs> and take the training to do that. So we're doing this here, but the earlier you intervene, the better is the outcome. That is pretty sure. But the FDA allows us only to treat patients seven years and older, which and a lot of these patients is at a stage where the dystonia is so, has progressed so far that it's very, very hard to revert that. And this is uh, actually showing you how we do this. Uh, and this, again, shows you this is a prospective uh, control trial. This was published in 2009, Lancet Neurology. Again, just to corroborate my point, this is not just neurosurgeons trying something. This is real class one evidence. Okay, and then finally, uh, I'd like to focus a little bit on, uh, on the areas of deep brain simulation where we really want to change behavior, which has the wonderful title psychosurgery, <coughs> which has a very bad reputation for very good reasons, <coughs> because it was abused brutally uh, all over the world, uh, predominantly in the UK with leukotomies, etc. So we stayed away for decades from psychosurgery, but of course, that, that was, of course, the other extreme. Uh, it is very clear that non-refractory depression, which means you have failed all drugs, all psychotherapy, and you have also failed electroconvulsive therapy, so there's nothing left for you, uh, is still a disease that is very malignant. A lot of these patients successfully commit suicide. So the idea to study this disease and find potentially a target to intervene, not an ablative target, but a modu modulation target for deep brain stimulation was intriguing. And uh, a um, Canadian uh, neurologist, Helen Mayberg, uh, who was in Toronto, is now at Emory, actually studied these patients very, very thoroughly with functional imaging and found that in this area there, subgeniculate CG25, these people with refractory depression, fulfilling those criteria, had hyperactive uh, CG25 areas. So there was a biological target for deep brain stimulation, which of course neurosurgeons who think in images and targets jumped on and said, fine, we can target that, that's no, no big deal, and see what happens. And uh, so there was a biological rationale to do this. But as I said, psychosurgery has a very bad reputation and it's very interesting because when the neurosurgeons and the, I call them the Mayberg scholars, jumped on this, uh, they were warned by some psychiatrists who thought depression is such a complex disease. To reduce this to a pea-sized CG25 target is a terrible simplification, number one. Number two, depression is probably not one disease even if you take this subgroup of completely refractory patients. So you're oversimplifying. On the other hand, these patients were mostly suicidal. You have nothing else. And deep brain simulation, that's something I should mention as well, it has an extremely low morbidity mortality profile. So then this went further. <clears throat> you can throw very expensive things at these patients, which unfortunately we can't do at the University of Chicago, 015 PET, but once we have the cyclotron, we can do this. You can look at the metabolic and blood flow activation and look at the connectivity with these techniques very nicely. The reason why most people use PET instead of MRI is once you have the electrodes in, you cannot do MRI scans properly, number one, you're changing the impulse generator, but number two, you get artifacts from these electrodes, which if you want to measure things very close to this, 
it gets difficult. We'll get around this hopefully very soon because we've now developed some techniques to actually mathematically take this artifact away. Uh, so this then went further and the next thing is that was sort of the response to the psychiatrist's critique of stimulating a small area is no, 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 we actually stimulate networks. We just take sort of points where all these fibers, which we can nicely see on the MRI scan, this is diffuse and tensor imaging, come together. So the big grand central station, that's where we put the electrodes and then influence networks. Great idea, but of course, it's, you don't know what the widespread networks effects are. And the other thing is, this is a DTI image. I can change the color of this with the switch of a button. And this is a theoretically, statistically derived image. It's, that is not really the representation of the fibers. And we recently had Ron Kikinis here from the Brigham, with whom we work now, uh, who has shown very nicely, depending on what algorithm you use, you can change this uh, dramatically. So it has to be seen uh, critically as well. And uh, then people went ahead and did a trial to put deep brain simulators into the CG25. And if you see this, the medical therapy where there's neurostimulation, and you look at the PD-394 score and other things, wonderful effect. These very, very sick patients had a significant response to the deep brain stimulation. But this was a non-randomized, uncontrolled trial. That's important to bear in mind. Um, <coughs> and the quality of life increased published in the American Journal of Psychiatry. And this then, of course, got the people with money interested, the companies, because we are talking about millions of patients uh, with refractory depression in the US. This is way more important than the few hundred thousand patients with brain tumors or aneurysms. This is nothing. This is a giant population. And then Medtronic and the people that make these stimulators got interested and said, this is what we want. This is a huge uh, profit source. And then they did a phase three randomized controlled trial, which was actually then to go right to the bottom, stopped by the FDA, because it failed the futility analysis. So in a randomized controlled setting, reproducing exactly the same surgery that was done in the uncontrolled trial, there was no effect, basically. So the concept was too simple. The problem with this is that <coughs> actually the, uh, uh, one of the uh, editors of the uh, stereotactic uh, journal of the American Society of Stereotactic Functional Journal is we had to write actually a, a letter to the NIH because these things then kill the field for a decade. It does, all this really means is that CG25 is an oversimplified approach and that might not be the right target. But what the NIH, of course, concluded is deep brain simulation depression is nonsense, doesn't work. So if you want to do more research, it's going to be very, very hard. So we had to rectify this a little bit that I think we need to revisit this in a very clear and scientific fashion and not jump to things because Medtronic wants to make money. <coughs> so, and uh, for another disease where actually deep brain stimulation is effective and is actually FDA approved, we still do an NIH trial on this, uh, is OCD. And uh, this, uh, we would propose, is the way to go forward. The trial is almost finished now. And uh, the reason why we actually did not participate in the depression trial were the ones I mentioned from the, the I think, valid critique from the psychiatry community. OCD is a very different disease. It is a very circumscribed behavioral disease to the point that if you watch these very, very sick patients, uh, it is actually it's a continuous spectrum with parts of Gilles de la Tourette syndrome where you almost wonder whether this is a real psychiatric disease or a basal ganglia disease, so bridging movement disorders. Anyway, it's a very circumscribed disease. We were very lucky to recruit John Grant from Minnesota, who's an OCD uh, expert, to work with us here. And so this is what we're doing right now. We actually implant these patients, and then we do sham DBS, active DBS, and look with FDG pets at the network activation and see 
what the effects really are. And uh, I think for any kind of psychosurgery, to jump to non-controlled trials is not the right way. We would prefer to do it this way. And actually, this is what we do. Coming back to the Grand Central Station, we're not looking at a just one tiny little target. We use wide spaced electrodes, go to the ventral striatum, and then we have these four contacts, and we can stimulate monopolar, bipolar. We can differentially activate large, uh, large areas, and hopefully by that, large networks. The other thing with all these approaches, looking at functional MRI, which again, we are looking at a two to three percent statistical signal with functional MRI over the baseline, which is the bold effect. We don't even know whether it's overactivation or underactivation we are looking at, etc. So we don't know this. So this is, for example, a patient with a left hand tremor. And tremor is a nice symptom. You can objectively diagnose it. You can do accelerometry and quantify it, get alphanumeric data. We don't really know. So you see over and under activation, and actually you see in the frontal cortex. So we are stimulating the STN because that's where we can stop just the tremor cells. Maybe we should stop the uh, target the left frontal cortex. And actually, transcranial magnetic stimulation, there are some very good trials showing that if you do this, which you can do on a daily basis in Parkinson's patients, you can make them asymptomatic almost. Take their bradykinesia away, just stimulate the motor cortex, stun it, basically. So we're not really knowing what biologically we're, we're, we're really targeting here. And the other thing is, a lot of people now are totally focused, and there's another depression trial going on in Europe to stimulate the uh, medial forebrain bundle. Uh, unfortunately, at my old institution in uh, Freiburg, uh, people completely rely on DTI images and use this to target and stimulate fiber tracts. Although these are statistically derived images of fiber tracts, and we don't know how accurate they are. So whether you stimulate function or anatomy is, again, uh, one of the critical questions. And then, even if we would have the right target, or the right fiber tract, or the right network, then, and we've shown this even very simple Parkinson patients with uh, Tao Z from our group, then you can change the parameters, high frequency versus low frequency stimulation. We don't know which one is better yet. So, there's a lot to be done in that area. And we have no idea how low frequency versus high frequency changes behavioral changes, network activation, etc. And then, of course, I apologize for the German scribblings, but the, this is, I got this from the Leibniz Institute. Then, of course, we are still talking about the past. The future is we are, will now have seven Tesla, 9.4 Tesla MR images, which will show us things we couldn't see. So this is the peripedunculine nucleus, deep brainstem nucleus, which you cannot see on any of our regular MRIs, but you can see it nicely on these seven Tesla. You can actually see the, each small little arterioles and venules going into the brainstem. So you get a precision imaging, which is unbelievable. And then the other thing is we have been talking all the time about one or maybe two bilateral deep brain implants. You can put multiple electrodes and stimulate simultaneously multiple networks. We have no idea how this works. Interestingly, this is the spatial resolution for DTI images. These little spaghetti fibers are almost, you can almost go down to single fiber levels with these super high um, Tesla MRI scanners. And then modulate where you put your electrodes so you can then selectively stimulate fibers. And if you know where the fibers go and what they activate, you have a, a much, much better grip on what you're really doing. So that's part of the future. Uh, and then you can model exactly where your current goes, what volume you activate, and then correlate that to the behavioral changes or to the uh, symptomatic changes you want to induce. And that is the only way to really strike the balance between symptom improvement, which you want, and least behavioral mood decisional capacity change you will induce as a side effect of your treatment. So 
the brain simulation and neuroethics. Um, from all we know from the evidence we have so far, it really doesn't change your biographical personality and your moral or judgmental capacity, but it certainly can change your behavior and your mood. Uh, but the important thing is risk benefit. So does the disease. I mean, Parkinson patients are severely cognitively changed as well. As a matter of fact, as I said, it's not a disease of the substantia nigra. A lot of Parkinson patients also have dementia and will develop this later in the course of the disease. On top of that, and this is Parkinson's, Huntington's, dystonia, all these patients are on medications with a lot of psychotropic side effects. And the other thing is uh, this concept, we think with our cortex, we are all rational, we make decisions, and this is what distinguishes us from other mammals. Not really, actually. Um, some <coughs> interesting studies, and that, that's outside of behavior, have actually recorded from the substantia nigra and the subthalamic nucleus in patients with essential tremor who don't have any real neuro neurodegeneration, whilst they were asked to make economic decisions, buying stocks, for example, selling stocks. And you would be amazed what neuronal patterns you see from the uh, substantia nigra and the STN, how that influences their decision making, <coughs> which partly explains the Wall Street crash, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> so we are limbic people, and if the frontal cortex does anything, it probably modulates and controls our limbic system a little bit, but a lot of decisions are totally subcortical. So we're not as cortical as we think, and when we think it's probably mostly subcortical, but uh, that, that has to be uh, borne in mind. And so I didn't give you an answer whether it changes behavior. I mean, I did give, it does, deep brain stimulation changes behavior, it changes mood, uh, it can make you more aggressive, more impulsive, any of this. But so does the disease, so does our medical treatment, um, and it has to be weighed, and that's, that's the important thing. And uh, this is a wonderful book from uh, Gerd Grigerenz, who was the chairman of psychology here for a decade or so. And he's now the uh, director of the Max Planck Institute of Psychology in, in Berlin. And uh, I think this is, and that doesn't only apply to DBS, it applies to all kinds of medical decisions, is really we have to weigh and first assess and quantify the risk that is associated with any procedure. Um, and then inform the patient. And the best is not to give him probabilities. Most doctors don't even understand probabilities, but to give them real number scenarios. One in a thousand. That's something people can uh, get much better. So that's, I think, uh, where we stand right now. And of course, our, our debates in psychosurgery <coughs> Psychiatrist thinks we are crazy when we do psychosurgery. Um, neurosurgeons think psychiatrists are a little bit loopy anyway. So it really depends on which, where you come from, which angle you use, which is very important to bear in mind as well. But uh, one thing is for sure, um, functional neurosurgery is going to move dramatically. And this is actually a Lancet paper from 1998. So in the past, we've been dealing with brain tumors and aneurysms. These are butterfly diseases on the spectrum of real healthcare problems we have. So the incidence of brain tumors is seven per 100,000, and for aneurysms it's around the same. Uh, whether we stop treating brain tumors or not will not change the life expectancy of the American population, for example. It's diabetes, lung cancer, Th these are the real diseases. We're a very small exotic group, but if we start at uh, looking at neurodegenerative diseases, stroke, trauma, neuromodulation, the big style, we're talking about log unit different patient populations. And this is where we are moving. Now we have worldwide more than 300,000 patients with deep brain stimulators running around. And uh, we now have implanted the first uh, people with closed loop epilepsy systems where we put electrodes into the epileptic focus, connect it to a uh, mini PC in, uh, in the skull, 
that records automatically the EEG and once it finds an interactal pattern that predicts a, uh, a, a seizure, then starts the stimulation to stop the uh, seizure. So this is coming as a wave and uh, we have, uh, when I came in 2010, uh, there was zero DBS and now we're uh, doing uh, 60 to 70 a year and every year we increase our volume by 40, 50 percent. So it's a big paradigm change in neurosurgery. Uh, but the important thing is Lars Lexell who invented the gamma knife and one of the stereotactic frames these things can also be abused. And if you don't know what you're doing, you can have the most sophisticated 7 Tesla MRI scanner. You can do a lot of harm, of course. And this is, uh, I think this is the summary. It's all about risk and benefit. And you need to have the informed, consented patient. Um, but it's not DBS only treats motor symptoms or the, it completely changes your personality. None of that. It does both, and to a varying degree, and probably different in each patient. Thank you. Uh, that's about, if, if you follow the literature, it's about one in a hundred, so one, roughly one percent. And the whole effort we do is to try to pick these patients up front, to tell them that this could happen, etc., test them with neuropsychological tests to see is there already a hint of personality disorder that will lead up to that. So we want to exclude those patients. But it's about 1%. But of course, there is, it's probably a little bit higher because there are patients who deliberately come because of my gray hair and say, I don't want deep brain stimulation, but I want the old procedure. Remember, we did functional neurosurgery way before deep brain stimulation, which is a lesion. You can lesion the thalamus and make the tremor go away on the contralateral side. The problem is you can only do it unilaterally. So the patient will have symptoms on the other side. But there are some patients who actually are willing to have the tremor remaining on the non-dominant side of their right handed, for example, in order to avoid deep brain stimulation. Thanks. Yeah, to answer the first part, I couldn't agree more. There's a conflict of interest and uh, as you might know, actually the group that advocated CG25 has actually, and I have no idea how this was possible, certainly in Europe wouldn't be, patented that as a target. So you cannot do it unless you pay, pay fees and royalties to that, that group. They founded actually a company to do that. I think that that's a the biggest conflict of interest I could imagine. And the other thing is, of course, uh, I didn't touch on this. Until this year, we had a major problem that is one single company uh, in the US that actually makes deep brain simulators, which is Medtronic. So it's a complete monopoly. It's changing now because St. Jude's and Boston Scientific have systems as well, which hopefully make things better. But uh, if you look at the papers on deep brain simulation, 90% uh, and more, if you look at the conflict of interest, show partly sponsored by Medtronic, etc. Except for the big uh, RCTs, uh, which strangely were run in Europe, but that's because it was developed in Europe. So there, there's no company involvement there, and they're all published in the New England Journal, etc. But I, I see this is a big conflict. The only thing to do is. It takes a lot of effort to do this non-company sponsored. This is why we insisted the OCD trial is totally company independent NIH sponsored. And you can only do it as an RCT, particularly in psychiatric disease, which is open to that many interpretations. Company involvement is a no-go and you have to use public money. And the second part of the question was, Oh, whether, it, whether it's being done in depression. Yeah, no, we're not doing any depression trials. Uh, we're trying to form a consortium. Plus, right now, CG25 is a dead target. I think we have to look at, at different things. One of the things is actually, I think, looking at fMRI is a, bit, a little bit too simplistic. We need more electrophysiological information. So one of the things is MEG, for example. But OCD has been FDA approved. F OCD is approved actually not only for deep brain stimulation but also for um, lesioning. 
in the internal capsule in the ventral striatum, gamma knife, radio frequency, because that has been shown also in uh, prospective control trials being effective. Thanks. Um, so how, how often is cooperation and that capacity of the patient a barrier to having surgery since they have to participate as an awake individual? Yeah. For me, as a neurosurgeon, rarely because I exclude all these patients. So if the patient is cognitively impaired or even demented, with quite a significant uh, proportion of Parkinson patients are, they're excluded from surgery. I need a fully cooperative patient because what we do is we test the patient uh, during the surgery clinically. So he has to perform tasks, movement tasks, cognitive tasks, etc. Um, so I think those are all filtered out already, but I would easily guess from our movement disorder board meetings that we have that 25% of patients are not candidates just because of that. Um, way in the back. Or yeah. Yes. Chris Kelly and then Larry. Yes. That, that was wonderful. I just wonder what percentage of your patients are studying therapy type studies versus just therapeutically uh, yeah, Parkinson patients are, uh, we have our own MJ Fox uh, funded trial, uh, so, but that pertains only to midline symptoms, it's a small subgroup, so 90% are just clinical indications. Uh, for psychosurgery, everybody's on a study. So the first, the first aspect, so patients with Parkinson's who really don't have a good symptomatic relief, that's a very, very small, that's about 10%. It's not that they have no effect, but we consider effective at least a 50% improvement on the tremor rating scale, etc. The interesting thing is we can still reduce their dopamine medication, and a lot of the side effects from, from dopamine uh, trouble the patients. So it's very rare that they get more depressed after the surgery, even if we don't get the effect we want to see, number one. Number two, because we can reduce the dopaminergic medication, we can then put them on other medications, which in combination wouldn't have been possible. Okay, thank you. And then did you say it's no longer used? Uh, yeah. We, uh, the, the actual morbidity is infection, which in the national average is about 6 to 8 percent, because you're, actually it's not so much infection in the brain, it's infection of the hardware, the big batteries, etc. To remove those is uh, extremely easy. It's not risky at all. Yeah, the, even in the brain. Yeah, I, just to follow up that question, um, one of the differences between deep brain stimulation and the uh, much condemned psychosurgery of the past seems to be the reversibility of this, that, that you can extract the wire, you can turn off the current. Um, you can go back to the, well, I guess my question is, can you go back to the pre prior state having tried the deep brain stimulation? Yeah. Is it the same state or is it different? No, you can go back and actually, uh, th that's the ultimate thing if the patient, coming back to your question, really has no good effect, gets depressed, and you don't even have to remove the wires, you just turn the system off, leave everything, don't, no more surgeries involved. Uh, you can do this remotely, turn it off, and the patient will go back to his pre-state. Well, no further questions. I want to thank you so much, Peter. My pleasure. Thank you.